Welcome to this podcast on electronic communications or e-communications. This will involve a discussion about questions related to networks and the internet in computing. These topics are from question 3 of the 2023 Information Technology or IT November Theory Exam. There are three ways that you can engage with the content of this podcast. If you want to test your knowledge, then download the questions covered in the video. There's a link to the PDF in the video description. Then go and attempt these questions and then come back and listen and compare your answers with the discussion. Or if you want to learn new information, then listen to the discussion first. Then download the questions that we mentioned earlier that is in the video description and test yourself to see how much you remember from the discussion. Or you can simply enjoy the discussion and learn more about electronic communications. And now let's hear what our podcasters have to say about networks and the internet. Welcome to the deep dive. Ever wonder how all the computers, uh, the devices at your school actually talk to each other and connect uh -huh. to the internet? Yeah, it seems like magic sometimes, but it's all down to networks. Exactly. And for this deep dive, we're really focusing in on school networks. It's specifically designed for, you know, high school computer studies students. Right. We want to unpack the essentials. Everything from the real basics up to things like uh, VoIP calls and getting access remotely. Our mission basically is to give you a clear picture of that digital backbone of your school. It's a good mission. And, you know, it's a great chance to look at why these modern communication networks are just so important in schools today. Maybe we can kick things off with a pretty basic question. Why would a school actually um, invest in this stuff? What's the real benefit for them and, well, for the students? That's a great starting point because it's not just about having shiny new tech, is it? Not at all. Our sources point to some really solid advantages. I mean, think about teachers sharing resources online instantly. That's improved productivity right there. Definitely. Cuts down on printing makes things faster. Or getting school announcements, like right away on a screen instead of waiting for a piece of paper. That's improved communication speed. Keeps everyone in the loop. And reliability is huge too, isn't it? Fewer network crashes when you're trying to get onto the learning platform or find a file. Modern networks are just built better for that. Hmm. Improved reliability. Yeah, that's key. And schools grow, right? More students, maybe bring your own device policies. Exactly. So the network needs to handle more users, more devices, all connecting at once. That's increasing capacity. Think about a busy library or the computer lab. Absolutely vital. And it's not just the number of devices, but what they can do. All the online services we use now, cloud storage, complex learning tools. Right. The network needs to support those modern online services properly. And um, collaboration. That's a big one. Working on group projects, sharing documents digitally in real time. Whether you're in the same room or someone's maybe working from home for a bit, improved collaboration is a definite plus. So yeah, it all adds up to a learning environment that's just more efficient, more connected. More effective, really. Yeah. Okay, so let's maybe dive into the, uh, the nuts and bolts then. How does this work inside the school? The local area network, the LAN, what are the key bits of kit, the essential components you need? Okay, the hardware. Let's break it down. First off, every single device needs a way in. That's the network interface card or NIC. The NIC, right. Think of it like a passport for your computer or phone to get onto the network. It's the physical bit that lets you plug in a cable or connect to the Wi-Fi. Without it, you're stuck offline. Good analogy. Your digital passport. Okay. <laughs> okay, so you got your passport. Now, how do devices talk to each other within the school? Ah, uh, that's where the switch comes in. Picture a switch like a really smart uh, local post office inside the school. Mm. It connects lots of devices together, computers, printers, and makes sure beta packets, the digital mail, get to the right place within that local network, that LAN. Okay, so the switch handles the internal traffic. Yeah. But what about getting out to the big wide world, the internet? Right, for that you need a router, and usually working with it, a modem. Okay. The modem is kind of like the school's on-ramp to the main internet highway, the connection from your internet service provider. Got it. And the router, it's the traffic cop. It directs the data traffic between the school's internal network and the external internet, decides what goes where. Makes sense. Modem connects you, router directs you. Mm -hmm. And all this data 
needs a path to travel on, right? Exactly. That means physical cables, like the Ethernet cables you probably see plugged into desktop computers wow. or other communication mediums. Copper cables, fiber optics sometimes. Yeah, they carry the electrical signals or light signals in the case of fiber. Yeah. And then for wireless. For wireless, you need wireless access points mm -hmm. or WAPs. These are the devices that actually broadcast the Wi-Fi signal. They create that invisible network field that your laptop or phone connects to. Okay, let's quickly recap the LAN essentials then. You need an NIC in every device, yep. switches for internal traffic, uh -huh. a router and modem for internet, the cables or wireless signals as the medium, the pathways, and wireless access points for the Wi-Fi. Phew. Okay. Now, let's imagine a specific school setup. Picture this. The network switches are connected one after the other in series, like a chain. Okay. Switch one is in the computer lab. It connects to switch two, which connects to switch three, and so on, all the way down the line to switch five ints, say, block B. A daisy chain of switches. Hmm. Okay. What's a potential uh, downside? What's a snag with connecting them like that in a straight line? Ah, well, that kind of setup immediately flags a potential vulnerability. It's like those old Christmas tree lights, you know? Oh, yeah, if one bulb goes out? Exactly. If one switch in that chain, say, switch three in the middle fails, mm. or even just loses power... Then everything further down the line gets cut off. Precisely. It breaks the chain. Yeah. So, switches four and five, and all the computers connected to them, they could lose their network connection completely. A single point of failure takes out a whole section. Right. So one failure has a big domino effect. And it's not just the devices connected to the broken switch, but everything beyond it. Yeah. And think about the cable connecting each switch to the next in that series. There's usually just one cable, right? Yeah, probably. That single cable has to carry all the traffic for everyone further down the line. If the computer lab on switch one is really busy. All that data has to squeeze through the link between switch one and two, then two and three. All the way to block B. That single pathway can easily become a bottleneck. You get congestion, things slow down for everyone. Hmm. Makes sense. Like a traffic jam on a single lane road. And it can make managing the network harder, too. Trying to figure out where a problem is when one failure affects multiple areas. Okay. Anything else? Well, there's also a slight delay, latency. Every time data passes through a switch, it has to process the data packet. Tiny delays. Tiny, yeah. Yeah. But when you have data hopping through five switches in a row... They add up. They can add up, yeah. Mm. Especially for things that need fast communication, like maybe video streaming or online gaming. Though maybe not the gaming at school, but it can potentially slow things down. Okay, so that series layout has some real potential drawbacks. Failure points, congestion, potential latency. Got it. So we've looked inside the school buildings... What if the school wants to get network coverage outside, across the whole grounds? What wireless tech helps with that? Right, extending the reach. Well, the most common one is still Wi-Fi, but you'd extend it using more wireless access points placed strategically. Like boosters? Kind of, yeah. Or sometimes dedicated range extenders, which just amplify the signal. For bigger areas, though, you might look at something like WiMAX. Oh, WiMAX. Yes, yeah, designed for longer range than typical Wi-Fi, or in really remote spots, maybe even satellite. And there's also mesh technology now. Mesh. Where multiple wireless points work together, creating a sort of self-managing wide coverage web. Interesting. So, practically speaking, if a school wants Wi-Fi everywhere, building the sports field slot. Most likely, they plan out locations for additional access points. Do a site survey, figure out where the signal needs boosting to cover dead spots, avoid interference from walls, that kind of thing. Makes sense. Careful placement. Or, as I said, WiMAX could cover larger outdoor areas with fewer installations, potentially. Okay. Now, a trickier one. Let's say the school has a student hostel, but it's uh, maybe a kilometer away from the main campus. How do you get the network out there? Yeah, a kilometer is definitely pushing it for standard Wi-Fi. So what are the options? Well, long-range wireless like WiMAX might work if the hostel is within range and there's clear line of sight. Okay. A really reliable, though potentially more expensive upfront solution is running a fiber optic cable. Fiber? Why fiber? Because light signals in fiber lose very little strength over distance, unlike electrical signals and copper cables. So a kilometer is no problem for fiber. It gives you a fast, stable connection. Right. Low attenuation. What about just using normal Ethernet cables, the UTP ones? Could you string those together? Technically, you could try, but standard UTP cable has a max length limit, usually around 100 meters for a kilometer. Wow. You need loads of switches or repeaters along the way just to boost the signal. So complex and probably unreliable. Very complex, costly, and lots more points where something could go wrong.
not ideal. Any other ideas? Well, there's the VPN option, a virtual private network. How does that work? You'd use the existing internet connections at the school and the hostel. The VPN creates a secure, encrypted tunnel between them over the public internet. So it's like extending the school's private network virtually. Ah, clever. Using the internet that's already there. Okay, let's switch gears now. Something that may be coming to classrooms. VoIP. IP. The school's thinking about it for calls. First up, easy one. What does VoIP stand for again? VoIP, that's Voice Over Internet Protocol. Voice Over Internet Protocol, right. So how is that different from just picking up a normal phone, a landline? The big difference is how your voice travels. <laughs> Traditional phones use dedicated phone lines, right? <laughs> a physical circuit. VoIP takes your voice, turns it into digital data packets. Like internet data. Exactly. And sends those packets over the internet, the same network you use for websites and email. Okay, so it uses the internet instead of phone lines. What difference does that make? Well, several things. Often, it means lower costs, especially for long-distance calls, because you're not paying for that separate phone network infrastructure in the same way. Cheaper calls. Nice. It also makes video calls possible, which standard phone lines can't really do. Right. And anything else? Yeah, you usually need specific VoIP phone hardware, or maybe more commonly now, software on a computer or a smartphone. An app. An app, yeah. But that means you can call any other device with the same software anywhere in the internet. And the cost usually isn't based on how far away the other person is. Distance doesn't matter for the cost. Okay, sounds pretty good. But are there like technical problems schools might run into using VoIP? Oh, definitely things to consider. Number one is probably the internet connection itself. It needs to be stable. Why is that so critical? Because if your internet connection drops out or is flaky, your VoIP calls will drop out or sound terrible. Imagine that happening mid-lesson. Yeah, not good. Okay, stable internet. What else? Bandwidth. You need enough internet speed, enough capacity. Voice takes some bandwidth, but video calls take a lot more. So if the network's already busy. Exactly. If lots of people were streaming video or downloading things, your call quality, choppy audio, laggy video could suffer badly. You need sufficient bandwidth. Okay. Anything software related? Sometimes, yeah. Software compatibility can be an issue. Everyone might need to be on the same version of the VoIP application for it all to work smoothly together. Right, keep things updated. And finally, while calls might be cheaper, don't forget data costs. Especially with video, frequent VoIP use can chew through a school's internet data allowance if they have one. Hmm, data usage. Good point. Okay, those are real practical things for a school IT team to think about. Now moving on slightly, another network term, intranets. What's an intranet? Is it just the internet? Not quite. Think of an intranet as a private internal website or a collection of web resources just for people within a specific organization, like a school. So private internet for the school. Pretty much. It uses the same technology, web pages, servers, but it's walled off. You need to be an authorized user, like a student or teacher, with a login to access it. Okay, secure and internal. What would a school actually use an intranet for? Give me some practical examples. Oh, lots of things. Teachers could post course notes, assignments, links to resources there. So like a digital filing cabinet for classes. Yeah, exactly. The school can put up the calendar, daily announcements, school news, maybe policy documents. Okay. It becomes a central hub for internal information and communication. Everyone knows where to look for official stuff. Right. A one-stop shop for school info. That makes sense. Seems very useful. Okay, last big topic, getting access from outside the school. Let's talk about remote desktop connection. Why would someone working from home use that to connect to their school computer? Remote desktop is pretty handy for remote work. One key thing is that the software for it is often quite easy to set up, sometimes simpler than a full VPN. Easier setup, okay. And once you're connected, it's like you're sitting right there at your desk at school. You see your school computer screen on your home computer, and you can control it completely. So you're actually using the school computer just remotely. Exactly. Any work you do, any files you change, it's all happening on that computer back at school. And often, the software needed is already built into Windows or other operating systems. Convenient. No extra software usually needed. Okay. So thinking about remote access more generally, maybe for IT staff accessing servers or that security example we touched on earlier, what's, say, one big advantage and one big disadvantage? A major advantage is definitely accessibility. Uh, authorized people can get to systems or file from anywhere, anytime, as long as they have internet. That's huge flexibility. Access from anywhere, big plus. It can save time and travel costs too. You mm -hmm. don't have to physically go to the school uh -huh. for every little thing. Right, uh -huh. makes sense. What about the downside? 
the main risk? Security. That's the big one. Every remote access point is potentially a way in for hackers or unauthorized users. Hmm. You're opening a door to your network, essentially. So a big security risk if not managed properly. Absolutely. You need strong security measures. Oh. Other disadvantages, well, it can sometimes be expensive to set up securely. You're totally dependent on having good internet at both ends. Yeah, the connection dependency again. And transferring really large files like maybe video footage from security cameras, mm -hmm. can be slow over remote connection depending on the bandwidth. Okay, so accessibility versus security risk plus reliance on the internet. Important trade-offs. Wow, okay. We've covered a lot today. We've gone from the basics of what a network is, why schools need them, the, uh, the essential bits of hardware. The NICs, switches, routers. Yeah. Then that scenario with the switches in series and its problems. Bottlenecks and failures, right. How to extend networks wirelessly or over distance. VoIP calls and their challenges, what an intranet does. And finished up with remote desktop and the pros and cons of remote access. It's been a real deep dive into the school's digital plumbing. Absolutely. Yeah. Hopefully it gives a solid foundation for understanding how it all connects together. So for everyone listening, next time you log on to the school Wi-Fi or access an online resource, Maybe think about those components, the pathways the data takes, and here's something to maybe ponder. Looking ahead, what do you think is the next big thing in network technology that might change how learning happens in schools? Something to consider as you continue your studies. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive. Just a reminder that a lot of the concepts covered in this podcast are also covered on our Computer Terms channel with individual videos. So make sure that you subscribe, make sure that you leave a like and comment. We'd love to hear from you. And remember, don't do it the long way. Do it the Mr. Long Way.